and welcome back to the second in our series of uh, video versions of this month in gaming history as we look back 20 years to October of 1993 um, and well if you watched last month's video you'll know that um, September was a big month for Sega and the Mega Drive a little bit slower this month as uh, joining really Columns 3 in only the only notable releases uh, is this Shining Force 2 which came out October the 1st in Japan but as you saw in the copyright there not until 1994 in other territories um, so Shining Force this is the second in the series uh, from Sonic Team actually uh, the RPG series from them. I don't really have any nostalgia attached to it, um, although I did play a little bit of Shining the Holy Ark on the Saturn. Uh, I do know that's kind of a, a different, that's a bit more of a sort of first person spin-off dungeon crawly thing. Uh, and the first few Shining Force games are uh, tactical RPGs, they're sort of SRPGs I suppose you'd call them. So uh, I'm jumping in from the start and I'm not really sure how much we're going to see uh, in about 10 minutes or so of unedited gameplay here, so um, be aware if it's not too exciting. You've already missed uh, the introduction to this, uh, to this game, which is a ridiculously long uh, sort of 5 minute intro, which is a massively long time for a Mega Drive game. Uh, so basically the setup is some thief has taken some gems of mystical power and uh, the, the king got uh, kidnapped, I guess, uh, by a creature who did something terrible. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it was all presented in the in-engine style, so uh, the, the assault on the castle uh, basically made the king spin around loads of times until he fell down dizzy as opposed to being attacked in any kind of way <coughs> which is quite endearing in a sense. So, um, where are we going? I guess I'm going to school. Very jaunty music here. Um, The thing is about doing an RPG in a video like this is that uh, we're really not going to get to anything exciting within 10 minutes, uh, but that's a deep well, uh, but we'll see. Um, so yeah, I mean, the Mega Drive at this kind of point in time was a distant not even second place in the 16-bit sort of console era. It was really sort of, it had a main share of, of a distant third behind the, the Super Famicom um, and the PC Engine. And a good deal of that was, uh, or a good reason for that was just a lack of RPGs on the system. Um, in fact, just, I mean, Sega RPGs sort of really amounted to, or RPGs on Sega system, uh, really amounted to, um, oh god, didn't mean to do that, search, I want to know what this is, but apparently it's nothing exciting. Um, that's a weapon shop, I'm never going to find the school. When are they going to get to the school? Uh, um, I mean, the, the Mega Drive was kind of well known for all these great sort of arcade game, arcade conversions and, and uh, platformers which really lended itself to the Western market. Um, but in Japan, this looks screwy. Good. Uh -oh. um, but yeah, really the sort of the, the RPG landscape in Sega space really amounted to uh, this, Shining Force, and the Fantasy Star series, uh, both those first party attempts. Um, and there really wasn't much in the way of sort of third party RPGs on Sega systems. And uh, that's really kind of why there was a lack of um, sort of mind space for the Mega Drive uh, in Japan. And if anything, the, the Saturn has a much bigger legacy in Japan than the Mega Drive does. And if you sort of go to any 
uh, sort of second-hand game shops here, you will find a lot more Saturn stuff than you will find Mega Drive stuff. We can't wait for Jaha. I know that um, sort of RPGs of this era and a lot of games do this. There's no static, and well, there's no just static frame for each character. Everybody's walking on the spot all the time. I guess everybody's really have healthy. Uh, that would be because of the kid's dizziness. He's fallen down, he's in great pain. Oh, that's it. I actually thought. You know, that was the cliffhanger before the press start screen. Uh, I actually thought he'd been kidnapped in some sense, but he just fell over. Chester a horse? With a human head? Is he like a sort of centaur unicorn type? I think he is. Wow, okay. Um, again, yeah, full disclosure, this is the first time I've ever played this game, so... Was just here, he got all dizzy and he fell down. Right, here we go. <laughs> He's clearly just drunk. Look at him. Just reasoning, isn't it? Kate's always handled his booze before. Today. Let's go to this tower thing. And uh, maybe something will happen before the end of this. Uh, did a lick. Which way? Which way? Now I'm not sure what to do. Ah, <laughs> oh, well, never mind. Uh, you didn't really see the majority of what made Shining Force 2 uh, good or different. Uh, as I said, it's, a, it's an SRPG, so there's uh, a lot more sort of cognition behind its combat and um, and all of that. And it's a sort of very sort of fondly remembered RPG series, uh, but it's not something we're going to get to uh, in 10 minutes per game here, which is my kind of self-imposed rule. Um, but yeah, Shining Force 2 uh, came out October the 1st, 1993. It's pretty good.
cool menu of this month continues with Mega Man 4 on the Game Boy. Uh, this might kind of seem at first uh, like it's a straight up conversion of the fourth Mega Man game on the NES which came out two years before. Uh, but Mega Man 4, or in Japan as it's called, Rockman World 4, is actually a kind of best of, uh, kind of amalgamation of Me Ma Mega Man 4 and 5. So there's some um, kind of altered stages and altered bosses uh, from both of those games here. Um, and yeah, I mean the, the, the first three Mega Man games on the Game Boy were a similar, were sort of designed in a similar way. They're, they're kind of like compilations of other Mega Man games. Uh, as you can see here, it's a fairly small selection of uh, things to fight here, or only four stages as opposed to uh, what the old Famicom Rockman games were. And um, I guess at this point, Mega Man was kind of as we see the introduction for, for Toad Man here with a very different, not the usual uh, sort of jingle to introduce each boss um, that you might expect from the colored versions of the game. But this is uh, a fairly, you know, fairly faithful recreation of uh, Rock Band on the NES was a little bit more of a zoomed in view of things, less going on. This is a much easier game than the, uh, than the Famicom version. Um, but at this point, yeah, Rockman was uh, in coming up to his sixth iteration in as many years. And we'll have a look at uh, Mega Man 6 or Rockman 6 next. Um, I always find this kind of ironic considering that uh, Rockman, of course, was created, produced, and all of these games were produced by Keiji Inafune, who uh, in more recent years has made a name for himself kind of criticizing the state of the the Japanese games industry and uh, how it kind of there's a lack of risks being taken in the Japanese industry creatively um, and yet this coming from the guy that made six Rockman games in as many years and um, you know now as an independent uh, has the ability to use uh, Kickstarter for whatever purposes he would like uh, and chooses to make Mighty Number no. 9, which is, well, it's another Mega Man game. Um, well, I don't know. I suppose his company as well is, as I'm doing terribly here, because, you know, talking as I'm playing, and the, the frame rate is not great on this uh, admittedly emulated version, which is why the uh, soundtrack is a little bit choppy as well. Um, I suppose uh, Infunia as well and his company Concept is also getting ready to release the second Soul Sacrifice game in a year. Um, so, you know, it kind of renders his, his arguments a little, a little bit mute uh, when he's as uh, creatively unadventurous as, uh, as the rest of the industry that he kind of vilifies. Um, but yeah, um, it doesn't really seem to matter when all of these games are very very good and all the the Mega Man games the Rock Man games are very very good um, if perhaps you know nothing not much stuff is is really new between them uh, Mega Man was also in a state of transition uh, into the sort of Super Famicom era and the 16-bit there were 16-bit versions of, of what would be known as as Rock Man X Mega Man X um, on the Super Famicom, and then there were still these, I don't know, traditional Mega Man titles coming out uh, on the 8-bit system, so around about the same time. I'm doing well here. A little bit better, anyway. But yeah, I mean, for a, a, for a Game Boy game, this is pretty technically decent, technically competent. Um, everything looks pretty nice, everything looks uh, very sharp and, uh, you know, despite the fact that it's a, it's a more zoomed in view, there's less of a sense of scale on the Game Boy versions because uh, that's what has to be done given the limitations of the sort of the handheld hardware and the fact that you had a lot of this sort of motion blur on the uh, on the vanilla Game Boy, the vanilla sort of green and yellow 
uh, shaded, those sprites would often come up with an, an awful lot of motion blur and it was hard to follow the action, but, uh, but this game looks pretty decent. giant robotics now. One of those, one of the many boss fights in video games that, uh, oh crap. <laughs> I was going to say, not difficult in any ways, I just died. Um, but also just really arduous and take quite a long time. Um, yeah, so I'm getting dumped at the beginning here. I'm revealing myself to be to be absolutely horrendous at 8-bit at platformers, as seems to be the traditional case every month. So uh, let's move on from Mega Man 4 to Mega Man 6. And here we have Mega Man 6, uh, which is 20 years old this month. Well, actually, Rockman 6 is 20, man, 20 years old this month, but uh, we're playing the American version here. Um, this, actually, despite my grievances with Keiji Inafune, actually only had Inafune has an artist on credit here, uh, underneath Tokuro Fujiwara and Satoshi Murata. And uh, Murata was also the director on Rockman X, which Inafune had a bit more of a hand on, on the Super Famicom. Um, and, uh, yeah, as, as we said before, six Mega Man game in six years, and um, nothing that really you know, might surprise you. It's it's the same sort of um, action here, the same sort of non-linear approach, the same pretty much game. Windman, Master of Wind here is, is who we're taking on. Um, it does look very nice. Uh, it also sounds very nice uh, in chiptune 8-bit sense, although um, just because of technical issues here, we're not listening to the soundtrack on video. Uh, so apologies for that. Um, but... <clears throat> I'm gonna. S there we go. Uh, but uh, yeah, as as hard as ever. But enemies being bullet sponges. I'm as terrible as ever. Uh, as you just saw, I've not really improved in the few minutes be between recording Mega Man Four on the Game Boy and Mega Man Six on the Famicom. But uh, yeah, it's as it's as good as Mega Man is. It's as good as Rock Man is. It's just the same. I think if you uh, if you complain today about annualized franchises that really don't add much to the formula, then man, you should have been around uh, in 1993 um, because this shit was commonplace. Whoops! Get on, Mega Man. There you go. Up. Uh -huh. Duh. See, you can't... Oh, I can. Whoops. I was pressing the wrong button to shoot. I just assumed I couldn't shoot while I was in the air. This is really going to make certain commenters pretty angry at my ineptitude. And there was, even at the time, a certain amount of blowback towards uh, Mega Man. I, I, all of these games reviewed very well in the press at the time, uh, but there was just this this overriding sense of, well, at some point, this is is just going to get too too much and too far. And um, you know, the the law of diminishing returns was was certainly in effect at this point, uh, despite the fact that this being a really late. Uh, Famicom game actually didn't make it to the West until 1994 uh, and as such it really does look gorgeous it, it really does feel like uh, you know everything was being squeezed out of the system um, so perfectly decent enough and that was kind of the mentality all of these games are good uh, it's just you know really how much of this how much of the same formula could we take all right, on to the main event game of the day, which is another sequel, but quite a big one. David Brabens, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it, wait for it. Here it comes, here it comes, it's in your, oh, it's the front, front, frontier, even more fronty than the last one. 
Uh, yeah, uh, Frontier Elite 2 um, from David Brabham and Frontier Developments, uh, which I think had just been set up in order to create Frontier, and uh, published by Game Tech and Konami, um, which seems like another one, Konami distributing stuff for, for Western computers. Of course, Konami were knee-deep into the NSX, but um, yeah, it, I, I don't quite know what the relationship with Game Tech was, but there was like a period in the mid-90s there where uh, Konami were publishing big box uh, computer games in the West. Um, I'm going to let this sort of intro sequence play out a little bit because uh, I can pretty well guarantee that this is much, much more exciting uh, than the actual gameplay that we'll get to uh, in a minute. Um, this all looks really uh, impressive uh, and I have no kind of nostalgia for really Elite or Frontier for that matter for different reasons. Uh, the Elite came out in 84 I think on the BBC and um, I was one then so um, I was kind of a little bit too young for it and then by the time I was old enough to kind of appreciate what it was. Um, you know, I, I didn't have time for it. And I guess Frontier Elite 2, to an extent, uh, when this came out, I had, uh, we had an Amiga 500 with uh, two megabytes of RAM, which was fairly powerful in Amiga 500 sensors. Um, but I remember, well, I remember somehow, I can't remember how, but I remember, and I'll admit to my indiscretion, uh, having a slightly less than legal copy of Frontier Elite 2, uh, trying to run it on an A500 and uh, it going at about two frames a second. Um, <clears throat> so that kind of, I don't know, rendered me devoid of any love for, for Frontier Elite 2. This is the first time really playing it on an A1200 setup, which again, admitting my indiscretions, is, is emulated. So uh, it is interesting to play this at, at the frame rate it's intended to be and, and the graphics it's intended to be. And it does look very good for a sort of 1993 uh, 3D polygonal uh, spaceship game thing. Um, what's more kind of uh, impressive about it technically is that this was all squeezed onto one floppy disk. In actual fact, like, um, you know, if you look at the, the size of the file that it is, the executable, it's half the size of a floppy disk. There was another um, floppy, there was a two floppy set in the box uh, on Amigo. Um, and <laughs> I love that. Frontier is the long-awaited sequel to Elite. That's so cocky in a sense. Um, so you get, you get a start position here, I'm going to start at the recommended uh, point. What was more impressive was that all of this was squished into 400k. Uh, and everything was procedurally generated, which is crazy, but that's also probably why it demanded so much of the hardware that my poor A500 couldn't handle it. Um, so, if you don't know much about Elite, if you don't know much about Frontier, it does just dump you just like this, and we have now started the game as I'm spinning my camera around here. Um, there's no real plot to speak of, you know, there's a few quest lines, as we'll see here, uh, as we go into the bulletin board, each sort of uh, planet space station you, you dock in has their own stock market, and their own bulletin board with their own sort of missions and, and series of missions, um, but you're kind of left to your own devices. It's, it's open world, but not its open, you know, universe, I guess. Uh, there's a guy here, uh, it's called Stacy. I suppose this is the 35th century or whatever, 33rd. Um, <laughs> doesn't really look like Stacy, but, uh, yeah, I mean, you will talk to people at every sort of planet or whatever. This guy wants a uh, passage for a small group, but I have no room on my ship. You can say I've only got, you start off with this tiny ship with, um, only room for three bits of cargo and, and no cabin, so we can't deliver people. Um, but kind of one way you can start is enrolling yourself in the military, and then that gives you a, a solid sort of line of quests, although there's, there's no real plot to, to speak of to any of this. Uh, you just kind of do well um, with whatever quest line you have, you get more money, you get promotions if you're in the military. Uh, one thing that's, that's different 
uh, to Frontier as opposed to Elite was that there was a much more in-depth kind of reputation system uh, to everything. Um, so whether you were doing legal or illegal actions, whether you were doing uh, good things or not, your reputation would kind of spread around the galaxy. Uh, and, you know, so that would kind of influence how, how the game played out. Um, although, you know, I mean, the you're left to your own devices. I mean, uh, your whether your success kind of depends on your kind of um, interpretation of it and your own ambition. Um, so, you know, let's get started here. I, I, you have to, very important if you're playing Elite for the first time, or Frontier for the first time, you have to obey the rules for everything. So if you don't request takeoff and just take off, uh, then you will get shot at by the police. And if I fired my laser here, the police would come and, and screw me up. And, my uh, Frontier experience would last about 20 seconds. Um, so I'm setting off for Parts Unknown, the formal halt system, I think it was. So I'm speeding away. You can see not exactly, you know, stunning frame rates and not exactly stunning graphics by today's standards, but uh, this was pretty huge to have all this um, appear on an Amiga and on a single disc game. Um, you know, as I said, everything here being procedurally generated um, in terms of how the planets looked and, and things of that nature, uh, which is really impressive. It just, but it ran like shit on uh, you know most sort of bog standard computers. Um, and yeah, I mean, whether as you see, I'm kind of screwing with time here. You can speed up, slow down, sign to kind of render these uh, journeys, perhaps you know longer or, you know, more, le more or less authentic, I suppose, to actually flying through space. But, um, yeah, whether you like or hate Elite and Frontier kind of depends on uh, whether you like or hate being directed and not having any direction here at all. It's very difficult to play today um, because Frontier was kind of relied on its big manual to kind of walk you through and there's no tutorial here and you know I'm just trying to figure this out based on a tutorial I found online um, you know and just game FAQs to, to teach us it's, it's you know multitudinous kind of systems and, and controls here so you've got a 3d space map I'm heading for a formal halt um, so I think I need that I'm not exactly sure how you set up the autopilot or you know I'm not hang on so you zoom kind of all the way in and yet that's in the middle so I'm kind of looking at a web page um, as I'm delivering this commentary and playing this game so it's a uh, it's perhaps not the most professional thing everything's all kind of um, you see the icons down the bottom side of the screens those are also like the the function buttons so you can play um, solely with the mouse if you know all the the sort of ways of, of fiddling about with that um, but I'm kind of using a combination of, of mouse and keyboard looking down on each um, and then trying to figure things out online so I'm down there and I need to get up there or I'm up there and I need to get down there I'm not sure which there go click no, wait, 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 wait. I have decided that the, the last game we look at each month is going to be a little bit longer, but um, I didn't exactly kind of anticipate most of my time being figuring out uh, how to actually play the game, and uh, this is going to go down swimmingly in, in YouTube comments, but uh, I am not going to edit. This is, this is Cinema Verite. Um, video gaming. Let's play guys, let's play, or let's look at a map and try and figure stuff out. Um, yeah, as I say, I really have no attachment to Frontier, and I have today kind of very little patience um, when it comes to uh, kind of incredibly open-ended experiences, and it's always something, and GTA kind of has the same thing for me. Um, I always kind of feel like the the romance of it is really a, attractive and I understand that um, but when I actually sit down and play these things um, I kind of get very easily sidetracked and, and kind of quickly bored uh, by it so while I'm trying to figure this out um, 
kind of a little bit about uh, where we were in October 1993. Um, there's been a lot of sequels in this video, but um, that's not all there were, to be fair. There was um, one big new IP uh, coming out this month um, in the arcades, and that was Ridge Racer. Uh, so while this was kind of being an ambitious 3D space shooty thing, and yes, I've done it, or space navigation thing, use the cursor keys on the zoomed out thing till that's highlighted green. Okay, so I should be set to go. Um, Ridge Racer was kind of doing similarly ambitious stuff with, with 3D racing in the arcades. Um, Virtua Racing had kind of been out, but this was the first time that it was, it was really sort of slick looking and, and you know, really smooth and doing everything with, with texture mapping. Um, and because it was on Namco's System 22 board, it was kind of easily ported to the PlayStation a year later. So uh, I think it's arguably more important to PlayStation even than the arcade. So we'll probably look at that sometime next year, I guess, uh, if I'm still doing this feature of 20 years in the past. So I do that, and then I click, and then I go back. Do I... hang on, I need to... wait, I need to look up some stuff. Okay, right, here we go. Here we go. Pre press, press, the, press all the buttons, yep, 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 start the engines up. Heading there, so I just hit the hyperspace, the F8 button. It just goes, right? F8, F8. See, it's there, game. Why can't I just go there? No. Uh, you can't track live viewers to this video, but people are probably tuning out all the time. Zoom all the way out. Zoom, zoom in. I just I want to go. Hey, my engines shut off in the background because I'm just staring at a map. Mm. It's gonna take too long to do this. Just just uh, flying from this view. Uh, I think I do need to use the hype space, but for the life of me, I can't figure out what I'm doing wrong here. Oh, I definitely don't want that. Off. Hang on, control. That kind of, I can just change the menu so I'm going to see where I can see. I don't really want to head back to where, where I came from. Well! So yeah, more exciting games like Ridge Racer, you're going to have to wait till till next year and the release of the PlayStation for, for us to talk about that. But um, if you head on over to the written feature of this month in gaming history, um, we do have a quick look at uh, at Ridge Racer. And there's also uh, in there on where there's uh, an extensive look at the 3DO, which uh, also got launched uh, this month. Uh, in October 1993 in, in America, which was a fascinating console. And, um, you know, if we had the sort of resources and, and abilities to, to do some video of that, uh, instead of me blundering through space with no idea of what I was doing, um, then, then there would be some of that instead. Um, you know, really, kind of, the, the 3DO marked as, as a failure by, by most, but Really, I mean, it's an interesting thing. If you looked at what the 3DO was, if you looked at it as if it was coming out today, uh, that it was this, you know, technology that was licensed out to different manufacturers in order to cut manufacturing costs. Um, it was something that had a really low... I've got it right. So Formal Hub is out of range of where I am. So I need to go to somewhere closer, but there we go. Oh, sorry, no video talk is kicking off now. Yes. Uh, 
Um, yeah, one of the, the rare pieces of music. Uh, for most of the time, you are just playing through space in the lead. It's, uh, now, got some drama happening here. So now, from here, I can go to. Oh, crap. No fuel. Um, great. This video kind of goes from bad to worse. But that's. That's Frontier! It doesn't tell you this shit before you start. It's kind of on you to plot out what you're gonna do before you actually do it. Um, otherwise you're gonna get stuck as I did, and perhaps I should have done a little bit of trading to uh, get more money to get more fuel. Um, so I don't know, I guess from here we're gonna go somewhere else and then kind of refuel I guess see if we can refuel so let's go to one of these planets I suppose and in the meantime I'm figuring this out um, yeah I mean 3DO was Kind of, it, I mean, it had a lot of these these great ideas. It had really low licensing fees for for publishers and developers in order to get self publishing from smaller people that couldn't afford big, um, you know, publishing contracts. It was it was kind of designed with independence in mind. Uh, it had all of these um, partnerships with with other media companies. It was going to be. Um, there were plans for for three D O to team up with America Online to make. An, an online gaming service for consoles way before the Xbox ever did it. Um, so there was so many things that were, were incredibly cool about it and so much that, that went down to just a combination of, of bad decisions, uh, bad decisions by their partners, especially Panasonic, and, and really just bad luck in terms of the timing of it. Um, so I really recommend that you do head over to wheredoesgodzillapoop.com and read our, our written version of this feature. Um, also because it will <laughs> edit out this kind of, um, I don't know, inept navigation that I'm going through here. So I'm going to head to this place, I guess, I think I'm, I haven't figured out how to turn on autopilot either. Um, It is just kind of this um, aimless wandering and um, that, that really, I don't know, it, it kind of, I'm feeling very turned off to, to Frontier at this point and um, I know, oh, oh wait, wait, so ah, you hit the F function button in here, so okay, I'm going to head to there, right, so that's flashing. Oh, what target's behind? Wait, maybe I need a different target. Is it over? Oh, there it is. But, uh, I want to kind of press on, so let's choose a different, a different thing here. Um, you know, I, I know if you're of a certain kind of era and you kind of had this on a machine that could run it at the time, um, with enough time to play something like this again at the time. Oh, that's what you do. Okay, so you just kind of fly through these boxes. Um, then it does, you are more likely to have a lot of nostalgia for, for this kind of thing. And there's an awful lot of, obviously, talent behind the projects and, and it's doing some really fascinating stuff and ambitious stuff. Um, it's just really hard to like uh, especially when you're just trying to shoot a 20-25 minute video uh, for the internet as well. Um, yeah, I'm not, really not a big fan of, of Frontier Elite 2 um, and probably wouldn't be a fan of Elite 4, which I think was, was kickstarted. Whoa, wait a second! Ship under attack! I can't actually accelerate time because I'm being attacked by that guy that's going, Wah. I know he's doing a very good a job of attacking. Oh, but that's, that's all I can do is press space to shoot one laser beam and 
and uh, I think he's, he's tearing through me. Um, see, his gun goes wah, and my gun goes kapwa. So, um, I think that's probably just a sign of that I'm a little bit screwed here. But, um, nevertheless, this is the most exciting thing that's happened in this video, so I'm going to try and stay with it, or should I? Should I get back on track? I mean, he is going to murder me. Bang. Bang. See, this is the other thing as well. Um, the ship you start off the bridge is really not set up for combat. Um, so, uh, as much as the fact that he's going to tear through me if he wants to, um, and he seems to be just dilly-dallying about, uh, I also have no real means to fight back. So, see if I can just run away, I suppose. And there he goes, off the back of my radar. Phew. Um, that was exciting, wasn't it? Uh, that's kind of what Elite is. Um, you can do all of this amazing stuff, but... Well, you can do all of this amazing stuff in theory, but I can't. Um, I imagine that this is what... Um, Eve, I, oh, wait, is that the game? Okay, Eve Online, there you go. Uh, I was thinking of Dust Bike on Um I imagine this is what Eve Online is to most, or to people like me. Just this, this great big expansive bewildering thing um, that I tool about it for, for 20 minutes and then stop and say, thanks, this isn't really for me. Uh, but yeah. Um, for more on video games, uh, old and new, did head on over to wheredoesgodzillapoop.com. This video is going up on side, alongside a written feature on Tuesday, October the 1st. Usually our history of video games uh, features goes up on or around the 1st of every month. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's this, there's Frontier, there's 3DO, uh, there's Ridge Racer, there's stuff from 2003, Max Payne 2 um, being a standout. Then uh, there's stuff in 1983, Donkey Kong 3 being released in arcades in, in October 83. So an awful lot of sequels as we get towards uh, the end of the year, but some really fascinating reading if I do say so myself. Um, so yeah, Chris Charm for WhereDoesGodzillaPoop.com. Thanks for watching.